I, I have a saying, um, I stole it from somewhere. I can't remember from whom, but it's no agenda, no attenda. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> if you don't have a structure plan in place for what we're going to talk about when we get together, and this isn't, this doesn't necessarily apply with one-on-ones. One-on-ones are more free form and like get to know each other and, and talk about things that are top of mind. Um, but if you are meeting with the team or if you're going over project work and there is no agenda, do not go to that meeting. Exercise your F and R. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a waste of time. Today's guest is Catherine Kohler, who is Director of Productivity Engineering at Netflix. Catherine's team focused on the development environment and associated experiences, which enable and empower developers on Netflix to bootstrap, code, build, test, debug, and maintain software more effectively and efficiently. Productivity is never a controversial topic in engineering, and with Catherine, we will dive right into it. We will discuss metrics, development process, releases, and platform teams. So let's dive in right after a short word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by One Schema, the embeddable CSV importer for SaaS that helps your teams save months of development time. While companies often scope one engineering month to build a CSV importer, they end up taking over three to six months to build all the features needed to make the importer usable for their customers. Customer files are full of unexpected data and formatting. Missing key features like a UI for easily fixing errors drastically reduces import success rates and causes endless emails for your support team. Enter one schema. With the large library of pre-built validations and robust SDKs, one schema helps you launch CSV import in hours, not quarters. Get your customers to the value of your product in minutes and let them say goodbye to frustrating messages like import error on line 53. Importing clean customer data into your product is now easier than ever. Learn more by visiting oneschema.co. Hey, Catherine, welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Oh my goodness, Luca, thank you so much for having me. It's really good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again too. So uh, I have to say, I was thinking about you a couple of days ago because you have to know that we have a book club in the refactoring community where we pick up a book, a nonfiction book to read every couple of months. Uh, and completely by chance, to, uh, the book we are reading this time is No Rules Rules. Uh, which for people who don't know is the book written by Reed Hastings and Harry Mayer with Reed Hastings being the co-founder and former CEO of Netflix. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting and Netflix culture is one of the most influential in tech today for, yes. many, for many reasons. Uh, thinking of candid feedback and kind of ruthless approach to performance. I mean, I, I don't know, you'll tell me. Uh, but of course, one thing is to read it in a book, like I can do. Another thing is uh, to leave it, right? So you are director of uh, developer productivity. Um, and I'm excited to have this chat. And the first thing I wanted to ask you is about this. So what makes, in your opinion, Netflix culture special? And how does this reflect on the engineering side, for example? Yeah, well, there, there are several things about it that, that make it special. Uh, the biggest component is how everyone is so bought into and protective mm -hmm. of the culture and reinforcing of the culture. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, some of the tenets and values of Netflix, we really, really go in for very candid feedback. Uh, it doesn't matter where you sit in the organizational chart, <laughs> you, you feel empowered and are encouraged to give feedback all the way up the chain peers uh, all the time, uh, which is unsettling at times if you're not used to that. But once you get used to it, it is very empowering. And, and we treat mm. feedback like, obviously, a gift. Uh, it's not just a, a, a platitude. Um, yeah. Context, not control, is also a very strong tenet of our culture, which means we as leaders and as peers give each other all of the relevant context so that we can make the right decisions at any level within the organization. So it's very, very different from 
command and control, where I go in as a leader and tell people what to do. Instead, I count on and rely on good judgment and expertise of the people on my team, and I provide the necessary context so that a lot of the decision-making is pushed down, uh, which is really, really yeah. nice. Um, it does get a little challenging the bigger the organizations get. Uh, sometimes it's hard to provide all of the necessary context without bogging people down or, or turning into decision or analysis paralysis. But that one is really, really foundational for, for our culture. Um, we also believe in loosely coupled, highly aligned, uh, yeah. which means trust components of the operation and business to work on their own and do their best work and then bring those things together. So again, it's, it's very much not that structured tops down approach, but very distributed in how we make decisions, how we work together, how even our components go together. Um, and then there's the dream team. <laughs> Netflix is famous or infamous, whichever way you look at it, uh, for treating our coworkers like a professional sports team. We are not a family. Uh, and this is, you know, we, we don't encourage rest and vest. We don't mm. Uh, mm. lean into, well, you know, they're, they're a lifer. They're going to be here forever because they're just doing the yeah. bare minimum of what needs to get done. We actively performance manage folks. We actively grow folks and we actively performance yeah. manage, which means uh, to sum up the keeper test, um, adequate performance is met with a healthy severance check. And so if you are someone on the team that I would not absolutely fight to keep, then you probably shouldn't be there. Yeah. So it's daunting. <laughs> uh, I used to make a joke in previous jobs um, about like, oh, there's so much work in front of us. It's job security. You can't make that joke yeah. at Netflix, right? You have to be on your yeah. A game. Uh, and sometimes your role just gets eliminated because the business moves. Um, it, it is not... Uh, intimidating or shameful to get fired from Netflix because a lot of really talented people uh, get let go um, because yeah. either the business moved or you know other things happen. Um, but from someone who has worked in organizations where it takes a really long time to handle a performance issue, this is actually very empowering because low performers yeah. on teams can sort of drag the team down. Yeah. Oh, makes totally sense. And I have to say, I come from a founder experience. I've been a founder in City over a small scale startup. And many of these things look to me as pillars of usually a startup culture, right? High growth yep. uh, companies and startups. And uh, much of this looks to me like fighting against what uh, sometimes yep. happens in big companies like bureaucracy, uh, on ladder the decisions that has to go through many, many steps. And yes. uh, so a lot of this with like staying in the startup uh, mood and way of operating, moving fast and fighting what happens to other big tech companies. Right. I mean, we do, we, we are sort of pressure testing the culture as the company gets bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah. right? Uh, as I mentioned earlier with context, not control, sometimes the complexity is, is so vast that you can't provide all of the necessary context to make that decision yeah. making. And so decisions have to move a little bit higher up within the, the organization. Um, you can't do everything with freedom. Oh, I forgot to mention freedom and responsibility. This one <laughs> really, really impacts platform teams and productivity teams. So we hire people who are exceptional at what they do and we count on them to have great judgment uh, and we give them a lot of latitude to make decisions about what they're working on, how they work on the things they do with a healthy balance of responsibility, right? If you choose to uh, use something that is not available from the platform team, or we, we call that going off paved path, yeah. then it's your responsibility to own and manage and support that thing for its lifetime. Um, <laughs> that doesn't work out so well in practice sometimes. <laughs> Uh, because people don't have all of the information to understand yeah. what lifetime ownership means. And so they're making decisions that, that have long-term impact that we'll end up owning as a platform team. Um, so yeah. FNR, it's a big one. I heard it eight times my first week on the job. And people are really, really mean it. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's sort of a tool or a double-edged sword that's sharp on both ends, right? <laughs> yeah, probably that's also because people are not used to 
think that way coming from yeah. other professional experiences. They're so, not yeah. used to having that kind of latitude. And then sometimes it can be weaponized. So it's my yeah. choice, right? I get to yeah. pick what I want to do. And I'm like, well, no, there are actually some <laughs> guardrails. <laughs> we, we are a streaming company. So we work on things that, that I mean, it's not that bad. Um, but sometimes within platform, your freedom is my regret. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and we, we'll, talk, we'll talk about this. So you have mentioned platform teams and productivity. So let's dive right into it here. Yeah. Again, director of developer productivity, right? So first thing I have to ask you is about the concept itself of developer productivity, because sometimes this is like an elusive concept, right? And there is a lot of debate, a lot of controversy. I think sometimes because people are not even on the same page about what yes. this means. And, yes. and so I would love to start from first principles, that is, what is developer productivity to you and how you think about the mission or of your team? Anything that you can do to make a developer's life easier is developer productivity. And uh, some other companies call it developer experience. We call yeah. it developer productivity. Um, We're in the fortunate position of being a company of enough size and, and, uh, and, and tenure to have developed a productivity organization internally. Yeah. Sometimes you will have ad hoc tools or a very passionate individual who is trying yeah. to smooth out an experience, probably for their team or maybe their organization. But we have taken that to the next level. Um, there are a handful of companies that do this <laughs> uh, yeah. where we have an organization that's about 160 people big. Um, if wow. you throw in product management and if you throw in technical program management, it's probably 170, um, where we really focus on reducing toil in the mm. Netflix developer's life. And that can take many forms. Um, it can be extending language platforms. It can be building out robust IDEs. It can be even managing source control in a way that has deeper integrations with other systems across the, the Netflix ecosystem. Um, we really go after, again, I, I used this phrase earlier, paving. Uh, and I think this, this is becoming more common, this, this phrasing, paving a paved path or a paved road of things that along the software development lifecycle, we have smoothed it out for you. We yeah. have taken a bunch of the Netflixisms away. Yeah. Like you don't have to worry about security, authentication, efficiency, performance optimizations, because we try to bundle all of that into the work that we do so that a new developer to Netflix or even a more tenured developer can just focus on their day job, right? Yeah. The thing that they were hired to do rather than having to understand all the way up and down the stack what needs to get yeah. done to yeah. own, develop, own, and operate their code. Yeah. I love how you framed this when you said that people don't have to care ideally about Netflixisms, right? So ideally you're productive when you, you don't have to carry that cognitive load of having to know how things work because yes. of the specific part of the platform you're in and, and you can just carry the healthy cognitive load that comes from, you know, having to solve the problem that you're at at that very moment. So yes. is that how you think about that? That's how we think about it. And that is aspirational. That is not where yeah. we are. Of course, of course. <laughs> right? Some things are pretty paved. Uh, some things are not so paved, right? And if you extend that paved road or paved path uh, analogy and, and beat it to death, you know, some things are cobblestones uh, kind of thrown into the wind and other things are super highways. You know, depending on, um, you know, our backend services are probably more paved. For creating backend services, we probably have more paving there than we do on the front end, which is something that we're now going to be focusing on uh, going yeah. forward. So, yeah. yes, that removing the Netflixisms, re removing the toil, really getting people set up to be successful in, in building effective and efficient code. Um, so we are yeah. the, the developers behind the developers. Yeah, yeah. I love the definition of developers behind the developers. So you both develop 
platforms and tools for others to build upon, but also mm-hmm. take care of, I don't know, best practices or tech choices to keep your small, maybe your footprint small on a number of choices yes. that the team has to make. Yes. And again, you know, this is where the culture has been kind of intersecting with what we're trying to do within platform. And a strong FNR culture, strong freedom and responsibility, strong context, not control. We don't have the top down directive of, of saying you must do it this way, uh, which mm. is challenging, but also yeah. exhilarating because you have to build things that people want to use. Right. Yeah. This is it's it's critical that we are developing things that that cause delight. Um, but because of context, not control, yeah. we aren't as opinionated as we probably should be. Uh, okay. And we're actually becoming more opinionated about if you have 30 options to do something, this is the approach you should take. This is best practices. Um, we should definitely buy more than we build, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. We should, you know, for things that cover 85% of your use case, use the yeah. paved road, right? And yeah. then stay close with the platform team to build out what you need, what is particular to you, or do more layering, right? Leverage the paved road and then extend the paved road within individual teams or organizations um, that don't have those higher leverage plays. So this, this is where it gets tricky for us <laughs> with yeah. the culture and, and yeah, running exactly. the platform team. Yeah. I, I, I'm thinking exactly how you draw that line, you know, between either going, in, uh, enforcing or strongly recommending the paved road versus leaving that kind of freedom. If that, yes. you know, that you draw that line at infrastructure level, language level, framework, library, yeah. I mean, what, what, what kind of granularity you, you you think about when you uh, when you think at a, at platform level uh, and this kind of paved road. Yes, so we want to make sure that whatever we build is high leverage and is extensible beyond just one customer organization. And and for those of you who aren't aware, Netflix not only does streaming, but we yeah. do studio production, tooling, etc. Yeah, we also do gaming. Right. We also do yeah. live TV now. This is something that we're emerging into, uh, and we are also doing ads, um, which is you know a, a break from the past. <laughs> so yeah. the platform team has to be able to extend to these things and pick up things that are high leverage, either servicing a very large customer base, say in our streaming segment, or can be very broad across more than one of those business pillars. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, if it is more of a bespoke solution for a smaller group of people, we'll see what that can leverage in terms of our offerings. And then we have this concept of local central teams that exist in our customer groups where they are basically platform extenders. Uh, They build some things on their own, which are not high leverage across the organization, but they also extend things that platform offers. Uh, And that's how we find that right balance of what should live within the lower platform team versus what what we shouldn't work on if it's just very bespoke. Um, But it is tricky. (laughs) It is tricky. And I would say that we go into it with the best of intentions and and principles, but sometimes it's test and learn, right? Sometimes it's really... Uh, build something scrappy in a customer yeah. org and then graduate it to platform. Sometimes yeah. we haven't quite nailed <laughs> what we were trying yeah. to uh, ship. And so we have to go back to the drawing board and really stay close to the customer and iterate and keep things small. Yeah, yep. that's very interesting. And you, you know, they say that platform teams are like product where your customers are, you know, other engineers are internal uh, people in your yes. company. So I, I wonder how you work in that respect, I mean, you have to do mar- the equivalent of marketing for what yes. you feel to make things adopted by other engineers in the in the team. Oh yes, uh, <laughs> I the the superpower, <clears throat> excuse me, of being in a platform organization is that our customers are right there, and yeah. it's also uh, challenging. So you know, if I some of my folks say. Oh, well, I don't drive adoption, 
right? Like once it leaves the borders of our team, I don't really have control over adoption. And I'm like, oh yes, you actually do. <laughs> you, you can go immediately to that customer, sit yeah. down with them, see, and, and we should have done this and we do this throughout the development life cycle, but how is it meeting their needs? How do we have that PR campaign? How do we actually yeah. leverage specific folks within our customer teams to be ambassadors for the work that we're doing? We have several different go-to-market strategies. strategies. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, we, we have about 2,500 customers across the board in terms of our technical community within Netflix. Uh, we do showcases where we have videos and, and show off. We have some science fairs type things where <laughs> nice. we'll set up tables and do booths and, and which has become a little bit harder during distributed times, but it's still pretty effective. Um, we send out newsletters. Uh, we have a, a website that sort of highlights all of the capabilities that we have. Um, and it, we still need to be more opinionated and that still needs to get more curated over time. Um, and we also are working on beefing up our discovery and learning. So if you have someone new coming into the company, they'll go through onboarding, they'll be exposed to a lot of the platform offerings. But then after that, if they have a question about like, I'm trying to do X, what is the best tool or approach for that? We're starting to pave that discovery and learning journey as well. Yeah. yeah. And so just like, just like a, a normal product, when it comes to feedback and new things to build, is yes. it more like a bottom-up uh, thing where you get input from the actual users about what needs to be built or you have like yes. a long-term strategy about what the platform needs to be about for maximum leverage? Both. <laughs> yes. Both. A, a long-term strategy, which I would say is more around principles, right? Manage mm -hmm. more for our users, curate more, uh, make sure that the paved path is covering high leverage use cases, um, drive adoption of the paved path, ensure that people can get onto it and can stay yeah. on it, right? Yeah. Um, keeping the fleet modern. Uh, mm. All of these things are sort of first principles that guide what we're doing. Uh, and then obviously support our business. Um, as things spring up, be able to support live, be able to support gaming, be able to support the things that, that can come in from the side um, that maybe we weren't as, uh, we didn't have as much advanced <laughs> knowledge about, yeah. right? Like these, we're, we're still pretty nimble and, and pretty quick from that startup perspective. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. And I wonder... Um, you know, one, platform teams, teams are one of the, I think, trickiest subjects for, for team organizations because many companies are confused about when they really need them, when they should yeah. start creating them based on their scale or their product size. Uh, yeah. and, and, once, and, and even if you create them, how they should work in practice with, you know, with the rest of the product teams. So... Do you have any advice on this? I mean, you, Netflix, of course, is at a giant scale with respect to most companies. Right. Uh, but do you think there are some tipping points uh, that you can recognize uh, for which you, you can say, I need to invest a, a fixed amount of resources intentionally about making platform better? Yeah, this is a really interesting one. Uh, I think the introduction of platform teams really depends on organizational size, organizational maturity, the breadth of the things that you're going after. I mean, there is always yeah. going to be a couple of common layers of infrastructure that teams can build out. And whether that's supported by a few members of a team or a large organization really depends on the size of the organization and the complexity. Uh, we began some version of platform engineering to really push the edge of what was technologically possible because we yeah. had concerns around scaling, around efficiency, around performance, um, just through the nature of our business where we can't take things off the shelf and stitch them together and say, yeah, we're good, yeah. right? So we had to build a lot of things from scratch. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. if, if we were starting a platform organization today, there would probably be a lot more things that are off the shelf because industry has caught up, not just with yeah. enterprise tooling, but with open source tooling, et cetera. 
So I think companies now that are at this intersection of size, maturity, complexity, uh, have a lot more choices and options to scale a platform team in a much more effective and efficient way, just given the nature of what's available out there. A lot yeah. of the big companies have paved the way, right? Um, yeah. You know, Spinnaker, uh, resilience testing, all these things that you can stitch together and, yeah. and sort of drive the productivity organization. There's still gonna be things that are very uh, bespoke to that particular organization, the problems they're trying to solve, where you're gonna have to staff up additional developers who really focus on developer experience. Um, but I think the footprint of that team size can be a lot smaller now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, given what's, what's available, yeah. Yeah, so, so you would say that platform teams should really be about building core things that you cannot stitch together or buy, you know, because they, you can find them uh, on the market and at the same time they represent a, instead a core yeah. IP or competitive advantage of your company and so you should invest in them. I think it's a yes and. I think that given what's available now, the stitching together and the building um, more bespoke integrations, that will be a bigger portion of the organization than the building things from scratch. Uh, yeah. Right now we have a lot of the building things from scratch still um, because mm -hmm. we own these systems, we've built these systems, we're operating them. And then we have to start thinking what's the trade-off of swapping some things out <laughs> yeah. with more things that are off the shelf. Um, but I think newer organizations who are considering developing a developer experience group or a productivity group, they have more options. And they, they will both be systems engineers who are doing integrations and, and building out platforms, leveraging off the shelf work. And then there will be, you know, back end, front end developers building out robust end to end developer experiences based on what the customer needs. Yeah, I agree. And speaking of developer experience, uh, does your team also own the continuous delivery part, the release process, uh, how that works? So the way that our uh, developer productivity organization is structured is loosely coupled with the software development lifecycle. Okay. I own the inner loop and I also own end-to-end -end developer experiences um, where we're building out more of a common portal for people to own and operate their software. I have a peer, or two peers, uh, one who runs the delivery space. So I run all the way up to continuous integration and then it picks up with another team doing delivery. And then it picks up with another team that does our operations. So SRE and observability efforts. Okay. So I'm the inner loop gal. <laughs> okay. 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 And the, the numbers that you said about, I think it was like 160 people or something. It, it is the whole uh, productivity. That's all the developer productivity. So I have about 90 folks on my team. Yeah. That's. That's an impressive number, by the way. Oh, that's great investment. It is a thank you, first of all. Second of all, uh, I think at, at, at larger organizations, it would be a much bigger team. Netflix is well known for running exceptionally lean. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we we run too lean, but we, we run exceptionally lean in a lot of places. Yeah. Another item taken from, you know, lean startup culture translated into big tech. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stay right on the hairy edge. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, yeah. and speaking of uh, productivity, uh, sometimes you said at the beginning, productivity is whatever makes uh, developers uh, better at their, their job, of course. And sometimes it's not just about tooling or platforms. Sometimes it's about having fewer meetings, more focused time, better interaction with their teams. And right. we, we, we often joke that the biggest offenders to productivity is other people rather than <laughs> uh, um, tools and pieces of code. Uh, so do you, um, do you do intentional work on that uh, with culture, with processes that optimize the, the developer experience? Yes. Uh... I also do some work to de-demonize meetings. Uh, I think that I, I have a saying 
Um, I stole it from somewhere. I can't remember from whom, but it's no agenda, no attenda. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> if you don't have a structured plan in place for what we're going to talk about when we get together, and this isn't, this doesn't necessarily apply with one-on-ones. One-on-ones are more free form and like get to know each other and, and talk about things that are top of mind. Um, but if you are meeting with the team or if you're going over project work and there is no agenda, do not go to that meeting. Exercise your F and R. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because that is a waste of time. But I do want to de demonize meetings okay. because a lot of the 10x productivity work happens for meetings that are effective, can align people quickly, you resolve decision making, et cetera, like really keep them actionable, really keep them focused, yeah. and then move on. Um, yeah. You know, if, if developers were left to their own devices, they would never have meetings and yeah. they would be super siloed and then they would go off and build wackadoo things. Oh, no, we can handle everything async. We'll all do it through a doc. Like, that doesn't work so well. Uh, yeah. So I do, for, for my own productivity, I try to actively manage the calendar to carve out focus time. I reinforce that with my folks. I want to make sure that anytime we get together, it's high value, that it's really, really worth the time and commitment of bringing a bunch of people together. We have strong FNR about if you don't think is something is worth it for you to attend, you do not attend, but yeah. we will rely on you to, to understand what's needed, to catch up on meeting notes, read the memo, et cetera. Um, optimizing your time, thinking about Every move you make, are you sort of kicking the ball toward the goal, being intentional yeah. about the work that you do? These are all things that I, I try to imbue from a sort of like social engineering or a socio-technical perspective about how to be more productive and how to be yeah. really protective of your time so that you can spend time doing the things that have high impact, similar yeah. to, you know, the things that we offer um, product-wise. Yeah, I agree. And I think meetings shouldn't be demonized and they're just a very powerful weapon. You know, they're very high bandwidth and we should just be conscious yeah. about when it is worthwhile to, to use them as opposed to when it is not. Yeah. So do you, have you, do you have lessons learned this way? That is what kind of meetings um, in your experience, in your team are worthwhile, you know, on a regular basis versus those and activities that shouldn't be meetings uh, yeah. usually. I think it's important for teams to plan together because it mm. brings people along and people have a voice. And as I said, a lot of the decision-making is bottoms up. Uh, I think it's important for the leaders to be in those meetings to help facilitate and, and sort of tie break on decision-making and provide necessary context. Uh, I think that having some cadence of a check-in where you are evaluating how we're doing against the goals that we've established, not just activity and output, but really outcomes. Yeah. So we leverage OKRs pretty effectively, quasi-effectively. <laughs> it's, it's challenging for teams within platform to really frame things from the customer impact perspective sometimes. But how are we doing against the, out, the, the actual um, outcomes and impact that we're looking for? And to have this be a collaborative meeting where people talk through risks and blockers and then they have, we have the right people in the room um, from yeah. executive sponsorship to leaders, to uh, individual contributors to actually unblock or maybe yeah. change plans and align people quickly on, on those plan changes because maybe we made the wrong hypothesis, maybe there was scope creep, maybe we we're shifting priorities within the business, or maybe we tested on something and we just figured out we couldn't do it the way we thought. Um, so yeah. those meetings I find are very, very high value. Um, I am also a huge fan of just shooting the shit for the first five minutes. <laughs> we have the Netflix five. And so we don't really start doing the meeting until five minutes in, um, we let people kind of transition between meeting rooms and whatnot and come in, but like really yeah. get to know each other and tell yeah, stupid small jokes, talk. Yeah. small talk. I mean, especially in this distributed workforce, my goodness, right. It's important to, to gel with your folks because only healthy teams build great stuff. Um, yeah. But those check-ins, having them at the right interval, you know, at some companies, those are considered like sprint check-ins or, or yeah. like the, the um, sprint review. 
Um, yeah. Other important meetings that we don't do as much of that we should do more of are retrospectives. And those around decisions or projects or improved processes, little P process, not big P process. Um, and, and just reflecting and then taking action items from our reflection and feeding that into what's next. Yeah. Um, and then annual planning, that's important okay. for us, especially with so many customers who are counting on us. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what's the cadence of all of this? Do you have like longer cycles for OKRs, like quarterly, and then you have also yeah. your bi-weekly smaller cycles on which you do this, alignment on this? This is relatively new rigor across Netflix, by the way. Um, we have quarterly business reviews where we meet with all of our customers and partners and talk about what we've done and what we plan on doing. Uh, we have annual planning, which starts earlier than it should. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like when uh, when the uh, Christmas decorations start showing up before Halloween. Like, wait, what is going yes. on here? This, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so, you know, we're, my goal is to push the beginning of annual planning a little bit further into the year. We usually start that in the fall. Um, annual planning, where we set those big annual objectives and key results at a high level. Uh, mm. We don't want to over plan. Over planning mm. leads to conformance to plan. And then oftentimes plans change. And so that was wasted time. Yeah. So keep that at the right level. Then we do the quarterly planning which should be a few weeks before the quarter starts. And gold star, if you get it done before the quarter actually begins, um, yeah. where you break down those annual goals into more, measure, more measurable increments yeah. where we're adding value over time uh, and break down the work into these milestones that are, again, not like totally broken down um, where you're spending so much time figuring out all of the things but enough information to understand who are you dependent on, who's dependent on you, what are some of the things that are going to need to come together. Yeah. Try to keep it, again, very high level uh, because we count a lot on the talent of our individual contributors to, to fill in the gaps as they're working through yeah. some of these problems. So annual planning, quarterly planning. With that, we have our annual business review, our quarterly business reviews with stakeholders, um, we have fortnightly check-ins, which is bi-weekly, but yeah. one of my, one of my coworkers gets on me for saying fortnightly, cause that's true. <laughs> so every two weeks we have a meeting where we're kind of going up from the bottom to talk through with each pillar within the business, um, what's going on and that's handled at my level. Yeah. And then every month we have pillar reviews for the teams okay. across the platform where we we're talking up to the VP level about, uh, outcomes and risks and blockers and things like that. Okay. So it feels like a lot. Um, we're still figuring out what is the right level of input. Is the juice worth the squeeze? Cause mm. we don't want to always be meeting. Um, yeah. But the nice thing is it drives alignment. It drives clarity and it also drives accountability, right? Yeah. Teams just don't go off in a corner and develop and then come back and go surprise. Look what I did. You, you know yeah. along the way what's going on. And because we're super interconnected with our other teams, um, we have a lot of dependencies on our cloud infrastructure group. We have a lot of dependencies across platform. Um, and our customers just want to know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I think, um, I don't think there is such thing like planning that shouldn't be done. Um, there are many, you know, uh, ideas out there that if you do, to plans that are too long term, it isn't worthwhile. Yeah. But I think the risk doesn't come from planning long term. It comes from not keeping the agility to change plans if things, you know, don't yes. go your way. Keeping some slack, you know, if, if there are opportunities that you want to pursue that you had not anticipated. So I think yep. it's more about that and keeping that agility rather than you should not plan. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you will get some pressure from usually the folks who are like, I hate meetings. They're also like, I hate planning. Like, ugh. Yeah. Eight OKRs. Rah. Folks, come yeah. on. Like, yeah. we, they ha we have to have some way of understanding where we want to go and how do we know yeah. when we get there. Uh, I'm a big believer in the further the thing out is, the less we should actually plan the thing. We plan as we approach, um, but we just need to know high level, broad outline, what is it we're trying to do directionally? 
Um, yes. So don't go break something down that we have no intention of touching until three quarters from now, because things are going to change and that's just going to be wasted time. Yeah. 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 Like, like Napoleon allegedly said, because you never know these things, uh, he said that plans are not all, always useful, but planning always is. Yes. So that, yeah. that's kind nice. of the spirit. I like that one. Presumably yeah. he said it in French though. Yeah. Yeah, probably <laughs> not in English. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so, so the uh, the the atomic unit is the this fortnightly uh, cycle. Is is that even for the for the development cycle for releasing things, or that is more? Relaxed? No, that's the, that's really left up to the individual teams, okay. and the teams will have their own meetings as well. The fortnightly check-ins. This is all very much from my perspective because I'm the center of the universe here. I'm kidding. Uh, I, the, I go to these fortnightly meetings where the teams are reporting up what's going on. On the individual teams, they're probably meeting weekly to talk through, okay. you know, updates and whatnot. But FNR, we really leave that to the teams to figure out the best way for them to operate. But the ask is come into these fortnightly meetings with updates on blockers, achievements, uh, considerations, do we need additional resourcing? This is really the execution review uh, yeah. to make sure that we can keep things moving and ensure alignment uh, and no surprises, right? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So let's move on. I'm, I'm seeing also some questions in the chat. So one thing that I have to uh, ask you absolutely about is productivity metrics, because, <laughs> you know, it's one of these uh, extremely debated topics uh, and you know, you're director of developer productivity, so you need to answer now. Uh, what, are you, what do you think about uh, engineering productivity metrics if you adopt anything in your team that is like Dora or Space Framework? Or how do you think about productivity in general as something that you can or cannot measure? Yeah. Oh, this is, the, I love that this is a raging debate right now, which yes. means that we exist in the universe. Like productivity is a thing. It's good, right? It uh, helps yeah, more attention in the space. Right? Yeah. There's no bad press. Uh, yes. So I'm going to, this is a little bit of a mind bender of an answer, or at least I think it is. When it comes to measuring your own team's productivity, it is an art. It is not a science. There are a few things that you can tap into. Uh, I do like space, Nicole Forsgren's space. Um, I do like Dora. These are things that are, again, art. Science yeah. more on Dora, art more on space. Um, and for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, please look it up. It's a wonderful read, but it's like satisfaction, well being, um, activity communication, efficiency, yeah. and flow. I forgot P. P was performance. Um, <laughs> it is not a recipe book, but it is really a way of conceptualizing how effective are your teams at getting the work done that they need to get done from an output and impact perspective, not just an activity perspective, not just lines of code and all this other stuff. Okay, so the mind-bending part is as a productivity organization, we have to find metrics that will evaluate how the work that we do and the products we create, platforms, et cetera, improve the productivity of our customer. Of course. <laughs> right? If you're on the and right so, track. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are we on the right track? Um, so I'm not actually looking at productivity metrics for my teams, because I hire excellent managers who are able to stay close to the work and move the furniture out of the way and see how effective and productive the teams are. I'm not doing lines of code. I'm not doing butts and seats. I'm not doing any of that. But we have to have a way as a metric to our overall organizational success to figure, it, figure out, are we eliminating toil from our customer? Mm -hmm. And you know you hear this. There is no unicorn metric, but yeah. if we leverage Dora, in some cases, like how long does it take people to push out changes? How long does it yeah. take people to remediate issues, uh, to discover and remediate? How long does it take people 
um, to, you know, roll out a hot fix or roll back or, I mean, like there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can measure as a proxy for our customers, which yeah. helps us say, yeah, you know what? Our observability tooling is helping people detect, troubleshoot, and resolve issues faster than they have in the past. Um, we have a fleet that is up to date and ready to go because people are confident in what we're deploying. They're confident in their tests, et cetera. That's going to affect Dora, right? Yeah. But I'm not looking at that for my individual teams because I trust my managers. Um, yeah. We use a healthy dose of surveys, probably hmm. too much. <laughs> like, hey, how depressed would you be to leave Netflix and leave this tooling behind? Um, those kinds of questions. Nice. Or, you know, do you feel like you can do your job effectively or that you're spending a, a ton of time looking things up and trying to figure out how to do X or there just isn't a solution for you? We have customer meetings where we're asking people. We observe folks going through their workflows. We have ways of identifying. And in some cases, it's hard to quantify, but in other ways, it's not. How productive are our customers being? But I'm not using productivity metrics as a yardstick or a yeah. performance cudgel over the head for my individual teams. That is the job of my manager. Um, <clears throat> I have worked in environments, excuse me, <coughs> where they are measuring lines of code and things like that, which is just gamified, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like there, there's, yeah. no, there's no room for that. Um, so yeah, that's how I think about productivity metrics. Is yeah, our org uh, successful in the work that we're doing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that you mentioned also surveys and taking data in, in other ways, because sometimes when people think of data and being data driven, they only think about, you know, analytics that they get from tools, et cetera. But you can, I mean, if you have a one-on-one and, and you receive feedback about the well-being of, of, of your report, that's data. Yeah. Okay. If you, if you, yeah. Uh, take a, if you create a survey uh, about how people feel about tooling and their job, that's data. So yep. you, you can be data driven without you know, the need of using yeah. Dora and, 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 and frameworks, I think. Um, but, and I think, you know what they say that anyway, data is neither good or evil. It depends how you use it. Uh, so, and I think many managers are confused by the fact that nowadays you can just plug many tools and they take these numbers for you, uh, yeah. but then they don't know how to use them in practice, right? And, oh man, um, I, <laughs> data science is a, is a discipline, right? Like yeah, how do I you mean, interpret the results? <laughs> you know, right? I mean, now let's say now that you know that your change uh, rate failure or, you know, your uh, time to recover is X, I mean, how, how do you use that number? Should you Right. Set targets? Should you drive conversations? I mean, do you have any advice for this for anybody who's just dipping their toes into, into these waters? Yeah. I mean, really look into what are your motiv motivations behind measuring these things. Are you actively working on something to improve a situation? And if so, yeah. do you have a baseline and can you see directionally that those things are improving? Or are you trying to read the tea leaves and paint yeah. a full picture about your teams just based on a couple of numbers, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? So I always talk about direction and amplitude, not necessarily precision. So if we actively are working to improve an area that we've identified as a bottleneck, either through surveys or feedback or our own observations of um, just how people are working through their, their workflows. And if we go after that thing, Let's make a hypothesis that we can improve um, lead time for change by 10%. That's, that would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then what are the different constituent pieces that we're working on to improve that? And then we measure that, right? Yeah. And we say, ah, oh, okay, yeah, we're actually seeing that this is having an impact. Um, what you can't do is just come in cold and say, oh, this number looks too high, <laughs> you know, or like, there must be something wrong. Um, it, is a, it is a tool to be leveraged in addition to using all of your other faculties and judgment and observations and conversations, does this match reality, right? Yeah. What if uh, that metric that you're trying to move doesn't actually show up as something that developers are upset about or, or saying, oh my God, it takes too long. Um, it shouldn't take any longer than a coffee break for me to do X, Y, and Z. 
you can use that information to focus on something else, <laughs> yeah. right? Like focus on something else that is really bothering folks. Um, we also leverage some mechanisms for our customers to input. It would be nice if I had this functionality mm. and then folks can upvote it so we can get some signal on, yeah. is this really an area that frustrates people? Um, using that as data, using feedback in our customer service channels about like, we're seeing a lot of issues around this. There's a lot of friction here. So let's go in and address that and see if those numbers will go down, right? If on, on average, I'm getting 20 issues a week on, on this particular experience, can I drive down those numbers to zero? That's how you use the metrics. That's, yeah. that's how you go after it is one part of a broader, more holistic view that ensures you're staying close. Like, what are, you, what are you really trying to affect change with? And then can you see that change is happening? Yeah, love yeah. that. I love the getting a more holistic picture because in the end, developer experience is about people, it's about the experience itself. So you can have maybe the best numbers in the world, but if people oh. think it's a miserable experience, oh my to gosh, use your tooling, then it's, I mean, they're right. I mean... <laughs> So uh, uh, it's their perspective that matters. So I, I think more than being data driven is about creating good feedback loops. Yes. Um, I prefer yes. to think about that. And feedback, you can get feedback loops by surveys, by talking with people, with tools that yep. get you data, of course, but that's only one of the, one of the angles. Yeah. And, and recognizing that sometimes if you're solving for one thing, another thing is going to go off the rails. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Or... Obviously, people are human. Sometimes gamification happens on some of these things. And really, really imbuing a culture, culture is so important on this, a culture of engineering excellence where we are leveraging metrics as a tool to help improve the customer's experience, not as a yardstick by which you personally, professionally will be measured, in which case it becomes punitive and then folks freak out, get anxious and start to gamify. Yeah. Right. Like you want them to be super introspective about why is this interesting? Why is it not interesting? And really push that decision making down to the ICs. Like, how do you think we would go about measuring an improvement here? And there's some yeah. funky questions, you know, funky answers like, well, we can't really instrument this whole workflow end to end because blah, blah, blah. But we can probably go after these things and these are po proxy metrics and then we can round it out with a survey. Um, yeah. The right mix yeah, yeah. of like leading and lagging indicators to just really nail, are we doing the thing that we, we think we're doing? Yeah. yeah. It, it's, I think it's both science and art. Yes. To, to keep the yes. right balance of yeah, leading and lagging indicators. I, I agree with your take. So awesome. uh, also speaking of, of productivity, I'm picking up the qu a question by Mandy about uh, whether you build AI tooling or you, whether you're leveraging AI uh, for better productivity in, in engineering, creating things internally at Netflix or just even using things off the shelf that are available mm -hmm. today? Yeah. Wow. What a year it's been for AI, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's been fun and exhilarating to watch uh, this, this all take off. And in, in the, from the perspective of productivity, like what better application of AI than yeah, yeah. taking things off your plate, like unit tests. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, are, we are all right? thinking about that. We, we don't Ooh. say it out loud maybe, but. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. I mean, now there's really no excuse for not writing tests. Um, That's the flip like... side of the coin. I know. I mean, I, my, my kids are like, eh, AI is coming for your job, mom. You're going to be absolutely irrelevant. And I'm like, eh, okay, bring it. Uh, <laughs> I, I think in terms of taking those rote tasks off your plate, um, helping out with type ahead, code completion, documentation creation, uh, customer service bots yeah. that are getting pretty good. If, yeah. if they're trained on your ecosystem safely, of course, you don't want to turn yeah. into a leak, leak all of your content to the universe yeah. kind of place. Um, it can take a lot of this stuff off your plate and actually be a productivity tool for productivity organizations so that we can focus on our day jobs, right? I even leverage the heck out of it for writing memos. <laughs> 
<laughs> we will cut this out from the, yeah, just, from the please, please take this part out. <laughs> um, you know, like aggregating survey information, like what are the top yeah. 10 themes that we're finding from our customers? Like give me a word cloud of things that people are concerned about. Dig into this, compare it with, you know, the, the what um, these language models understand about the industry. Like it's really fascinating. Uh, yeah. You want to you want to trust that it's going to give you some good results, but you obviously want to verify it. You don't want to just like yeah. you know yeah. push this out into the the world without going. Yeah, actually that makes sense because sometimes um, these responses can free associate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in in terms of you know something like Copilot, uh, GitHub, uh, or very powerful. Uh, particularly yeah. for our front end developers. And, and yeah. they've had studies that, that, you know, code completion or suggestions um, actually make people better. Even if yeah. you don't take everything, and I think the acceptance rate is like 37% holistically, it's not Netflix, but like holistically in, in okay. some studies, um, grain of salt, uh, the code that people are submitting is of higher quality than it would be otherwise. Um, yeah. So there's so much there to tap so you embraced into. It. You embraced it completely, speaking of Copilot, because you know there are other big tech companies who are kind of more concerned about privacy, security, and yeah. other things. It, it, so we went in eyes wide open with yeah. ensuring that our information is sandboxed. Okay. Right? And, and yes, that may limit us in some respects, uh, but... Our domain is so large that it's still incredibly powerful. Um, we, yeah. you know, we're 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 cautious, but we're not. Um, we don't want to stand in the way of our developer productivity and efficiency. So we take the necessary precautions to make sure that we're pretty safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. makes sense. Makes sense. So I, yeah. I have a follow-up questions here from the chat about uh, about the productivity metrics topic, uh, and this is whether it is healthy to compare yourself to other teams. I mean, th there are many benchmarks, you know, about elite performance, top performance, whether yeah. you should aim for this or that number on that metric. Do you think yeah. this makes sense for teams to even check out? So I tell my kids this all the time, and this is not to belittle the answer. Um, comparisons lead to unhappiness mm. because yeah. we are all very unique in what we do. Our teams are unique in what they are building, where they are in the development life cycle. They themselves know how can you do an apples to apples comparison on things like this for teams? Yeah, It, it doesn't make any sense to me. And this is where it is so critical to have excellent leadership in place mm so that they are the ones moving the furniture out of the way and developing a high-performing team and using those metrics that they're capturing in terms of their own productivity, if they are, for their team. Yeah. <laughs> when you start to get competitive uh, with like, well, that team has a velocity of blah. I mean, like, let's think about the agile example, right? If you're using story points, like velocity is very much specific to the individual team. It could Absolutely. be zebras or jelly beans or weather or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to compare a zebra with a jelly bean, right? It is a tool for you to internally recognize how the team is operating. Now, what you will look at is what is the outcome of what this team is building, right? Are they moving the needle on customer success metrics? Uh, and that also really depends on, is it R&D? Is it a mature you know, product and they're kind of sustaining. Yeah. So you have to have that really, really deep invested knowledge about what is the shape of the team? What are they trying to do? Are they hitting the goals? Um, are they funded? Is, is it a healthy team, right? Do they, they yeah. offer to help each other? Are they selfless? Do they have a great culture? Good cultures, great cultures, build great products. That's what you should be looking at and not comparing yeah. the two teams or, or across yeah. teams. Yeah. Uh, I agree, but I, I also have to say that is I think it's hard, and that's where you you need to have great leadership because you know these numbers are right there at an arm's length. Sometimes yep. yeah, it's easy to see, hey, the top uh, percentile of 
teams uh, release at this frequency, do this and that. So we should do that as well. I mean, it's so it's so easy to to take the shortcut and say, yeah, uh, we have to do like these other guys do. Well, then let's take the long cut, which is yeah. if this is an area where you think you you have identified the team needs to improve. Why don't you have a great relationship with that other team and figure out if you can share best practices? And then if this is yeah. something that you really want to improve on because it's getting in the way of your team being a high performing team, then measure to see if the effort you're putting into improving that improves it. Again, directional and amplitudinal, it's not even a word, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what is the direction and amplitude of the thing that you're trying to change? Because you're now focusing on that, right? Um, but not, I'm going to get a scorecard of all my teams and compare them and just say, ooh, this team, mm, no, that, yeah, that, that doesn't feel yes. good to me. Doesn't yeah. feel good to me neither. I agree. Yeah. The last thing we need are teams that are operating from a place of fear and anxiety. Yeah. So I have a final question that is, you mentioned before that um, briefly that you are a distributed team anyway, maybe part is remote, part comes uh, in real life in the office. So how that is working for you? I mean, how uh, have you transitioned maybe from being 100% remote during the, the lockdown and COVID? Yeah. And, uh, maybe you, you're now gradually, maybe people have come back to the office, but how are you managing this? Many big tech has have issued return to office policies. Other has stayed remote first. Yes. And how is it working for Netflix? Netflix was ruthlessly co-located before yeah. the pandemic. And then the pandemic made us grow up really fast when it came to supporting remote work. And it was challenging at first. We didn't have the principles or the hygiene or the best practices mm -hmm. of ensuring that people could talk and that you know, meetings could flow. And um, one thing that was in our favor was we're a very heavy memo-based culture. And mm -hmm. memo-based cultures do support asynchronous working and ensuring that folks are aligned. But we still would have problems once we return to the office and probably a third of people return to the office. Um, the rest moved or we have hired subsequently remotely. Um, sometimes those important conversations wouldn't get captured. So we've tried implementing decision logs where if you have a conversation in the hallway with somebody, you bring it back to the Slack channel for the team and say, hey, FYI, just had this conversation. I'm going to loop everybody in. Um, our meeting etiquette's gotten better. Meeting tech has gotten better. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, yes. That was <laughs> that was another good outcome of the pandemic. If there a is a way, to... a nice byproduct of the of the pandemic. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it was just such a, a horrible time um, for everybody, and, and so many people were impacted. Um, we are a lot better at this. Uh, I I would say we're remote friendly. We're not mm -hmm. remote inclusive, and in the distinguishing component there for me is, and this is my own, my own org, I'm speaking for my, my groups. Um, we're not going to low in, I don't want to lowest common denominator everything, right? There are times where I do need everybody in the office and we yeah. do that twice a year because we yeah. want to build those relationships and have those touch points and have those serendipitous conversations. Um, I let, I, I encourage teams to also bring their teams together um, two times during the year uh, in the in the other quarters. Um, but we do everything that we can to ensure that everybody has a voice and people are included um, with also the recognition that working remotely is very tiring. Being on video all day is, is uh, not ideal, <laughs> right? Yeah. So being supportive of our folks, um, making sure that we have the best environment we can, continuing to lean into memo culture, sharing everything on Slack, uh, but you also ask like, hey, there's been this, this thing where companies are calling folks back. Netflix, one wonderful aspect about our culture is we don't have policies. <laughs> We're not going to unring this bell. People have freedom gone and responsibility. remote. Yeah, freedom of responsibility. We will, we will hire people with good judgment who work well remotely and good on you, right? Like it's an excellent way to diversify the workforce even further. Uh, and, you know, remote talent is exceptional. Yeah. So we're, we're embracing it. So there is no going back in short. No going back. No going back. <laughs> awesome. I, uh, I agree. So basically you, you keep the IRL, let's say meetings for 
uh, retweets and keeping and creating bonding and relationships but the, yeah the bulk of Twice the work a... needs to yeah. work well uh remotely yes some teams are more co-located than others you know i have some teams that are completely remote uh if i have a team that is more co-located in los gatos uh it's important for me to have a local manager as well so it's really you know fnr what, what is best for this team um and and how they operate and some teams come in like i have one team that is 99 percent in los gatos and they come in every day uh, i go in three days a week because what i do is is important to have face time with people sure. um, but i also want to work remotely so that i can empathize and understand what it's like to not be in the office <laughs> right yes so absolutely yeah. absolutely amazing that's great. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much. We are wrapping this up. Uh, Love this chat. I took so many notes and uh, <laughs> this will all come together in a newsletter edition and we'll uh, let great. you know as soon as it uh, comes out. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this chat valuable, you can subscribe to the show on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Also, please consider giving us a rating or leaving a review as that really helps other listeners find the show. You can find all past episodes and learn more about the show at refactoring.fm. See you in the next episode.